Our guest today is George Sugis, who is from Athens, Greece, and moved to the UK to study at the London Film School, where he made five short films which competed in more than 50 festivals worldwide and won between them five Grand Prix and four Best Director Awards. Then George returned to Greece in 2002 to direct Close Your Eyes, a number one rated primetime hour-long weekly drama for Mega TV, and the series went on to become one of the most popular series in the history of Greek TV, winning multiple awards. Well, he's here today to talk about his Oscar-qualified short film, The One Note Man, that he wrote and directed. Now, the film stars actor Jason Watkins with the voice of Ian McClellan and the music by Oscar-winning composer Stephen Warbeck. Now, the film recently won the Grand Prize and the Best Live Action Short at the Rhode Island Short Film Festival. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome writer, director, George Sugis to the show. Welcome, George. Thank you so much for having me. Great to meet you. Great to be here. Well, I tell you what, I fell in love with the One Note Man. So what inspired you to write this story? Well, I was going through a Hitchcock phase and I was rewatching all of his films and I read the Truffaut book again and I was listening to, uh, to, to, to an interview on YouTube, which uh, was just the audio uh, interview, no, it wasn't, uh, there was no picture. And he was talking about the man who knew too much, Jimmy Stewart and Doris Day. And uh, the film starts famously with a caption that says a single crash of symbols and how it rocked the lives of an American family. And then we open on an orchestra and the camera s starts zooming in onto this man st standing there with his symbols, just waiting for his cue to crash them. And eventually it crashes the symbols and the movie starts. So Hitchcock explains that he got the idea for this opening for the man who knew too much when he saw a 1921 illustration in the funnies by an artist called H.M. Bateman, British artist, which showed a musician waking up in the morning, having his breakfast, putting on his clothes, riding the bus to work, walking the steps to, up to uh, Albert Hall, sitting at his place in the orchestra, patiently waiting for his cue. And when the conductor cues him, he plays a single note, after which his job is done. He waits for his cue to get up. He gets it. He walks back to the bus, takes the bus home, has dinner, brushes his teeth, and goes to bed. And I thought, wow, that's, that's an idea you can hold in your palm. It's such a clean idea for a short film. So I developed it into a love story um, about taking that brave step into the unknown and of perseverance. Well, why did you choose the bassoon as the instrument of choice for the lead character? Because it's funny. <laughs> so, you know, I decided that this is going to be a comedy. I mean, it, it, it just, uh, I, I decide this. It spoke to me. This is a comedy. Obviously, it's a rom-com. So, you know, we needed an inter I needed a, to find an instrument that's, that's funny. And for some reason, the bassoon makes me laugh. The, the sound and also the way it looks and it's big and it's, uh, you know, I, I don't know. It's just a funny instrument. Well, it, it absolutely works. Now, I loved how a film can be so entertaining without dialogue. And when working with no dialogue, what does the script actually look like to an actor? <laughs> well, I would, I would think it looks uh, at, at parts delightful because uh, the actor doesn't have to remember the dialogue. But at other parts, I would think quite scary because uh, the actor needs to convey everything um, um, th through body language, through micro acting, because you don't want to be too on the nose um, on everything. And, and Jason, Jason Watkins, wonderful actor, um, was just absolutely marvelous in that sort of, uh, you know, acting. So in his so measured 
acting and uh, just conveying the story brilliantly with his eyes and his body language. Well, see, that, that brings me up to my next question because with no dialogue, for you as a director, how do you balance between the character's movements and facial expressions as well as the camera's ability to tell the story? Well, that's a good question. Um, I never saw it as anything different than when I'm shooting with dialogue. So you want to tell a story. So you're doing exactly the same thing you're doing as if you have dialogue. And maybe music replaces dialogue. And I have the amazing, amazing fortune to work with uh, uh, Academy Award winning composer Stephen Warbeck who won an Oscar for Shakespeare in Love and who's, who's done uh, Billy Elliot also in many other movies, but amazing composer. So uh, Stephen became my co-storyteller and we journeyed together and we started, Stephen was the first person to start working on the movie um, as early as five months before we shot it because Stephen replaced a lot of dialogue. So I, for me, for this particular film, the challenge wasn't the fact that there was no dialogue. That was the, in the script stage, that was the challenge. It was like, okay, I'm at page five. Can I take it to page six without dialogue? Can it hold? Can I tell the story? And it turns out that uh, I, I could. But uh, in terms of making the film, it wasn't much different in that respect. But it was challenging, very challenging, because it was, it was like a puzzle, this, this thing. Because of the repetition, because of the, you know, um, the, the the montage sequences. And yeah, it was almost like Groundhog Day. It was all it's exact. Yeah, like Groundhog Day. But you don't want to shoot everything when you shoot the, the second day. It's a different shot. It's a different lens. It's it's different performance. So every single little bit that you see in the montage sequences is a new setup. Is a new storyboard. It's a, it's a new design for a, a new little story. So that was really challenging. I mean, the, the, I've never had a slate before that says 2 slash 1.2 M4 3. It was, it was, it was uh, you know, a crazy... Well, did you, did you have the film scored before you actually filmed it? I mean, did Steven score this completely before you started... Rolling film? <clears throat> Absolutely. He scored it completely. Uh, the music is original mu music. And, and it, was, um, it, was, it was really particular with this. Normally, as you know, you shoot a film, you lock picture, and then composer comes in and you, you spot music and you, they score. But with this one, because we had that section of the orchestra, and the orchestra needs to play, the, needs to, uh, we need to film to playback because you can't expect them to be performing live uh, 25 times uh, you know, uh, a day. So, and also quality needs to be the same. So playback, which means we, we, we needed to have that orchestral section recorded before we started filming. So yes, we recorded that um, in December and we shot the film in March. So we had that, but also there was another reason. Um, because I storyboarded the whole movie. But for that particular scene, there was a moment where he falls in love and he hears the violin and he hears it first and he falls in love with the music first and then he sees the, the, the beautiful woman, the violinist. Um, I needed to know exactly how, I needed to know if the music that was available to me was long enough to tell the story based on the shots I had storyboarded. So what I did is I provided Steven with, an, with a, a, a pre-visualization, a pre-vis of the sequence, which is basically an animated storyboard, so that Steven could see exactly how long I needed for the violin solo to go on for in order to tell the story with, with the shots. Um, and then he wrote to that length. So it was a, a, a sort of a prop process in reverse in this uh, occasion. Super fascinating. Well, 
One of the things I was watching, because I watched it more than once, because I really wanted to just try to look into the film and look at all the little nuances that really built the story. Because, you know, when, when you're doing a short film, <clears throat> and they can range from five minutes to, to 20 minutes, it's amazing how much a director can get in to a film. <clears throat> and... If you're having, a, if you're doing a film and there's no dialogue, um, did you ever have to tell the actor, uh, "Let's reshoot this"? And if you did, why? I mean, was the expression not spot on, or was the look of the eyes a little off? I mean, how would you tell an actor, "Let's do this again"? Well, when you're working with an actor of Jason's caliber. Um, you're really fine tuning on the day. So uh, Jason came completely prepared. He learned to play the bassoon. He could play the bassoon so well, his, his part, his, his one note and then the solo in the end, so well that we had uh, a, a bassoon expert on the set, uh, 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 like an advisor, who said, I buy this. He's playing it. It's incredible. So Jason was so prepared that I really didn't have to really say much to Jason, other than, like a conductor, um, make sure that the timing was right. So for, for what I had in mind in terms of edit, in terms of where we were, because, you know, when we're shooting montage four, which is, you know, the later stage of the repetition, that's a lot faster than montage one. So. I would go to Jason and you know explain where we were at any given point, and because we we shot we stack shot those sections obviously facing this way, shoot everything this way. So uh, as you do, um, so that was uh, really the extent. So, but you know what? We started we started the movie and we would discuss a little bit. But by by the end of day one, it was like faster, just do it faster. That was the the, the extent of my direction. <laughs> well, how many how many days did it take you to uh, to shoot the whole film? I shot it in five days. In so we five doing, days. In five days, we were. I was doing forty setups a day, which is pretty fast. And I had two cameras for uh, the orchestra um, part, which which makes sense. Which you know I need it, but otherwise, single camera, five days. And Jason actually played the solo. Jason towards the end. learned to play the bassoon. It's not him actually playing the uh, the, the recording was uh, was recorded by a, a professional bassoonist, uh, but uh, but he could he could play the bassoon and he could play and he did play his uh, solo on the day. And the uh, uh, expert on set said some, he's he's doing it. I, I buy this. You know, I thought I thought one of the best examples of acting, and of course, ladies and gentlemen, there's no dialogue in this film, and it doesn't need any. But you know, you chose actress Crystal Yu as the conductor, and I loved her because mm -hmm. her eyes told you what she was thinking when she was glaring at Jason Watkins, yes. and I yes. love that. Yes, that's great that you saw that. Because I don't know if you remember Fantasia. And, you know, we go back to the birth of cinema, which was silent, of course. And if I think of all the movie moments which really are burned into my memory and those moments that stay with me, they're all without dialogue. They're all visual moments of pure cinematic visual storytelling. Um, Disney's Fantasia. The, the first 25 minutes of 2001. And by the way, there are, there's 88 minutes of, of no dialogue in that film. That's a, that's a feature film, you know, worth of footage with no dialogue, of story told no dialogue. It's a lesson in filming. 88 minutes, yeah. Well, you're, and you're right about Fantasia. I mean, so, and, think and about... Blue, Blue Velvet, the beginning of Blue Velvet. Uh, the girl in the red coat in Schindler's List. The recent amazing, incredible genius moviola scene in the Fablemans, where the kid realizes his mother's having an affair with his uncle. What a what a cinematic moment! 
with no dialogue, just just pictures. Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, the list goes on. So the golden rule is don't if, don't if you can don't say it if you can show it. That's the golden rule. So Crystal was just phenomenal, and she was. I, I told one thing. I said, Crystal, remember the wizard in Disney's Fantasia? He's he's stern, but 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 also. He's, he's like a father. There's love in there. That's the, that's the conductor. You know, you know. So he's there, she, she's there to chastise, but also in the end, she recognizes the hero's perseverance and spirit and the fact he did step into the unknown and the fact that perhaps, um, you know, in his hero's journey, he also answered the question of who am I? So well, I yeah. want to, I want to step backwards before that, because as you know, here is the guy that's going to play one note day after day, but his life mimicked that one note. I found it interesting that he was sitting there eating breakfast with a metronome. Mm. Uh, his toothbrush had to be turned a in a particular direction, and there was all there were these these little things that he never changed. He was caught up in his own comfort zone, thinking that's all life was ever going to be. And until that fateful day, until you know a wayward thread of the sleeve of his jacket gets caught on his instrument. And then life changes. And I love that. When we, when we meet him, um, our hero has lost his spark. He's not depressed, um, but because of his loss, he's fallen into a routine. He's become happily complacent, which I think many of us can identify with. I, I know I can. I've oh, yeah. been there. And I'm sure a lot of people have been there. And so one day, as you say, when he faithfully, when he's delayed leaving the orchestra and, and stumbles across that divine solo and is delayed, um, what happens to him is I think what happens to all, all of us with everything good in our lives, they never come this way. They always tap us on the shoulder and it's like, where did that come from? It's always unexpected. And so he's at the crossroad. So, he, I, and I personally love being in the, in the water, in the ocean, where my toes can't touch the bottom. So I love the fear. Uh, you know, it, it keeps me, you know, uh, alert. And that, that sense of excitement, like whenever I'm, I'm making a, a film or a, a new show or, a, you know, a drama, that feeling of excitement and fear at the same time, that's exactly where I want to be. And he's lost that. So he did. Now, and, now he finds it. So what is he going to do with it? Exactly. And what I loved is that every moment of this film, on the emotional, on an emotional level, the viewer feels every character. From, the, from their movement to the look on their face, from eye contact. If it's the funny stern look from the conductor, from Crystal, you feel every scene in, in the one note man. And, in, and when I looked at the fact that the, he has this, this wayward thread from his sleeve jacket and gets caught around one of the parts of his bassoon. And I looked at it and I thought, wow, sometimes in life, disruption brings an unknown blessing but that that disruption in in the moment causes us like you said there there's fear there could be embarrassment uh where he he was struggling to control the situation not realizing that when he finally got up and then he heard that violin solo he stopped and he turned around and that, to me, was just a beautiful moment in this film. Well, thank you 
for saying so. And I, you know what, this is, this is what it's about. Um, I personally tell stories for this. Um, I, you know, I, I like to ask questions and, and, and that's all I have to do really. And I don't want to answer them, but it's great that, uh, it spoke to you in such a way. And for me, that's mission accomplished right there. Yeah. You know, Thank you. and you're very, very welcome. And it's a stellar film. And, you know, I saw traces of Jason's character. There was, I guess there was a bit of OCD. Uh, and like we had said, there's simplicity in the routine that could be a, a safe zone for, for so many people. But is there a life lesson that you wanted the audiences to take away from this film? Um, I would hate to preach to the audience anything and to, to, to tell the audience what I, I believe is a life lesson. But I, if I would say anything, it would be you have a voice and it doesn't matter what it sounds like. It's your voice. And it's important for us to hear it. So let us hear your voice. I love that. I love that, George. You know, it seems that that love is the most powerful disruptive force in life. Um, is that what I saw in this film? Love is the most powerful disruptive. That's that's beautiful. That's great. Disruptive. <laughs> disruptive. A disruptive force. A disruptive force it is. And and sometimes it's incinerating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can agree with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, of course it is, you know, because it's all consuming and there needs to be balance in that too. It's all about balance. But his OCD goes away when he's, you know, in love. So he forgets about the toothbrush. So is it OCD or what is it? So that's the thing. <laughs> but well, absolutely, love is destructive. But love is, uh, what, what, what else is there? What else is there? And I, I you know, for me, it's crazy. The news, it's so negative all the time. I mean, the way it's uh, fed to us these days, um, it, it, you know, it, it sells. Uh, negative news sells. I don't know. And we're bombarded with desire. I turn on the news. I don't want to switch it off after two minutes because I'm depressed. There's uh, disasters, uh, COVID, uh, recession in the UK, the climate change. Oh, my God. So I just felt I wanted to just tell a hopeful story and to feel good and, and to, to be entertained and to laugh and maybe cry a little bit too. And yeah, um, tell a story about love, which of course is the most, the, the, the thing that we all want and what we need and we should give. And I just hope that the audience feels the same way. Oh, oh, they, they will. And, and this is a very, this is a film that just, it's a bright light that we all need to have in our lives. And in a way, there's, you know, I see that there's teaching moments. You know, when, when love appears, you have to take a chance. And I love the fact that with Jason's character, it was almost like watching a nervous uh, elementary school kid or, or maybe a teenager that's like, oh, I want to ask her out. But he's so nervous. He doesn't know what to do. And I love that fact because even at Jason's age, there was this innocence that appeared um, that was just so pure. I mean, mm. like I said, you just did a stellar job. There's dignity. There's dignity in this character. And Jason brought that to the character. And this is why I'm just in awe of Jason. My, the whole cast. Um, there's, there's a, a lot of dignity to this character and, uh, you know, it's, it's all down to him. Well, you have a star studded cast. How did you get these people together? Well, um, you know, sometimes with some projects and scripts, you, you, you try and you try and it's so hard and, uh, to, to get people attached and all that, but, but, but this one, for some reason, from the beginning, you know, the first person I approached was Stephen Warbeck. He was my only choice. I'm a huge fan of his. And we were both with United Agents in London. And so it was relatively easy to get the script to him. So I immediately he said yes. And I was like, what do you mean he said yes? 
what, what, what else did he say? Nothing. He just said yes. <laughs> so, so, and I meet with Stephen, and it's beautiful. And he's a wonderful, warm, generous, incredible man. And, and then Jason, the same. And uh, Ian McKellen, the same. And, and, and we, you know, we're looking for money, and we found money. It was just, I, I think the, the script... Um, without wanting to sound too, uh, to blow my, my own trumpet at all, but I'm, I, I just think that the script resonated with people. I can't explain it otherwise. No, I mean, it's everybody uh, so, can relate to yeah, this film. It's one of those, you know, it was, we, we got it made. Well, see, uh, that, that's... I don't, I don't, why? <laughs> see, that's my thing about film. If you're going to make, if it's a short film or if it's a feature film, I like it when those that put these films together, that they look at a broad audience to have mm -hmm. a film that reaches everyone. Um, in this year's Oscar qualified class, there's a lot of them that are very uh, narrow uh, in their audience. And so it's going to be interesting on how those play out. But when they're broad range like this one, Look, love is universal regardless of the age or regardless of the story. Everybody can relate to this. So I love the one note man. Um, I'm going to be rooting for you on this one. Uh, but I, I was interested too because none of the characters in this film are named. Uh, is there a particular reason why? Well, no one ever calls them by their name. Obviously, there's no dialogue, so there's no way to know what, who, who's, you know, who, what name, who's called what. Um, on, in the script, they were named the conductor and the one-note man and the florist, and you know. But uh, other than that, um, they weren't. And you know, there was an interesting, um, interesting thing that happened while we were shooting. The, uh, yeah, the, the the only way I think to make a, a film with no dialogue work is if you if you don't make it contrived so that the audience doesn't think okay I'm watching a film with no dialogue it sort of creeps up and you realize hold on have I heard any dialogue and I'm I'm six minutes in oh I haven't heard okay let's see so the way to do that I think is to um, eavesdrop on a situation at moments where there's no dialogue so. Just before we kind of cut into the flower scene, obviously they're said to each other, can I have a bunch of flowers, please? Oh, how much? You know, two pounds 50. Thank you very much. He's paid. That's when we cut in. So all that has happened. We're just looking at the moments in life. Well, so you, you brought up, well, you brought up Hitchcock at the very yes. beginning. And Hitchcock of... was always about camera movement. Oh my God! I mean, the opening of uh, *Rear Window*, which is one of my favorite movies, was his. You you learn everything you need to know about Jimmy Stewart in the first two minutes just by panning across items across his uh, his uh, apartment. The broken camera. Okay, so he's a photographer. Oh, he's da he lives in danger. He's an adventurous. Great. Oh, okay, it's broken. So, oh, he has an accident. Oh, the cast. Got so everything you need to know. And there's a woman. So everything you need to know. So, um, so you do that by just, uh, you know, uh, just, uh, so no names, I guess. And, uh, yeah, but there was an interesting, um, incident while shooting. Um, at some point I said to Jason, and we were shooting with a florist and I said, uh, well, okay. Cause I think the florist said, do we, have we said this? I said, look, say it. And by all means, start this scene by saying how much and so that I cut in and it's, it's it feels normal so that you're not so I literally cut in after the dialogue and Jesus said no 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 I don't know what he sounds like I don't have a voice for him and I thought wow yes of course of course he didn't have a voice for him he doesn't know what he sounds when he speaks so that was very interesting to hear you know from an actor's point of view yeah, that's that's a professional actor's yes. point of view co coming in to <laughs> yes. the craft. I love that, George. I love that. Now, how did you put the orchestra together? So the orchestra to record the actual piece that you hear in the movie, that's lot that you can see in the picture, the music that you hear, that was all Stephen. He got his own people, collaborators that have worked with him for years. Um, 
um, I'm terribly sorry, but I forget the violinist he uses. Her first name was Jackie. I forget um, her surname, but anyway, just incredible violinist came in with this violin, um, which which uh, I believe she told me cost nine hundred thousand pounds, and three people own it because it's so expensive. <laughs> so these incredible musicians came in and recorded the music. Now on the day we hired, um, much cheaper. Uh, but lovely and amazingly talented musicians, but the musicians that didn't have to actually play and have their music recorded, but they were there for the filming and could actually play, which was, of course, incredibly important, and why I cast Louisa, who can play the violin and who's a, an actor, of course. Um, that was really important to me. Um, so, yeah. Uh, the, the orchestra were, uh, you know, just uh, uh, a normal sort of orchestra, and they work all around the place, and uh, they came and filmed with us for three days. Well, I was wondering if Louisa was mm -hmm. actually playing that violin, and, mm -hmm. well, I guess that helped because she has that talent. It had to be that way. I didn't want to, first of all, I want, because this is so music-centered, I wanted people who know how to read music and how to play music and who could, could play the instruments that I'm showing on the screen. I didn't want anybody to go, ha, ah, you've cheated it. They're not playing, you know? So I really wanted that authenticity there on the screen. Um, well, so, they, every element is authentic. Thank you. Um, and Louisa and I had worked together before, uh, so she was a very, very easy uh, choice. She's just uh, lovely. Well, how does it feel to have your film Oscar qualified? Feels amazing. <laughs> it's kind of surreal, like all these things. It's like you're, uh, it's like it's not real, you know. It's uh, like you're observing yourself from above or something. But it's great. <laughs> well, I mean, because as a filmmaker, for you, being a director, you are a multi-award winner in many categories. Where would you rank this? This is very close to my heart. So um, it's really, really high on the list. In terms of my short films, I made eight short films so far. This is the eighth short film I make. I, I made a bunch of short films at film school when I was uh, much younger. But in terms of the short film um, sort of catalog, uh, I guess this is uh, number one, definitely. I'll tell you another story. Um, we won that award at the Rhode Island uh, International Film Festival. We won Best Picture on Hitchcock's birthday. August 13th, that was the award gala. We won Best Picture and it was Hitchcock's birthday. Now, how crazy is that? Well, maybe that's a sign. <laughs> maybe that's a sign there. <laughs> wow. Well, are are you working on anything? On are you working on anything new? Yes, I am. So I am currently um, writing the feature length version of the One Up Man, um, and uh, I'm I'm hoping to uh, finish that soon so we can um, utilize the short. Uh, to help us finance it. Well, I was going to ask because there are some short films that I see that I think I could see that as a full length feature. Mm. And mm. now that you've let that cat out of the bag, I can't wait that when it is done to go to the theater and actually see the full feature of the one. No man, that would be spectacular. That would be awesome. That would be now. Uh, you know, when it comes to now, I am a big lover of short films because it's amazing how powerful a film can be in such a very short amount of time. Um, and how difficult it is to do it. But yeah, exactly. To tell a story, to tell a full story with beginning, middle, and end in 15, 20 minutes, incredibly hard. And to involve the audience emotionally. Exactly. And, and that's the thing about short films. It's really about engaging the audience on an emotional level. You know, it's not like a superficial superhero film where you just sit there and, you know, and your brain doesn't have to work for two hours. But with a short film, all of your senses are brought forth uh, in different ways. Uh, you know, 
for a lot of people, you know, they only, the only people that ever see short films are those at the festivals. Are we mm-hmm. are is the general public ever going to have the opportunity to see the One Note Man, um, the short version, anytime I soon? You, I promise you that. At the moment, the only way to see the film is the festival circuit, and we're definitely letting uh, letting it do the run. Um, but we are in uh, talks with a uh, distributor. The film will be distributed. So uh, watch this space. Absolutely, yes. Great, because one you know one of my uh, you know one of my uh, deals about short films is I wish that the theater chains would start showing some of these short films before a feature film, so the general yeah. public understands the power. Uh, and in some ways, the entertainment of a short film. I mean, it beats watching, yep. you know, in my day, it used to be cartoons used to appear before. You'd a see the film. cartoon. Absolutely. You'd see the cartoon. It's hard to market. The, the, there's no market really for the, the short film uh, today. They're hard to market. They usually don't make uh, any money. Um, that would be lovely. That'd be great. But, uh, you know, with Netflix now and the platforms, there are short film sections within those platforms, um, which is great. So this uh, is enabling short films to be seen um, by wider audiences, people who enjoy this sort of thing. Well, short there story. we go. Well, ladies and gentlemen, George Sugas has a Oscar qualified short film, The One Note Man. And this is a film that I have got my eye on very, very closely because with so many films this season, this one literally and sincerely is one of my favorites. Uh, I have loved this film. And for a film with no dialogue, it really brings you into the story. And you can't beat a story about love. And George, again... Oh, such an incredible body of work. I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you. You're very welcome. And ladies and gentlemen, when you have the opportunity to ever see The One Note Man or the big feature film that we we're going to pray for it to come to pass because this is definitely a film that the whole world will want to know. Again, love makes the world go around. And why not, why not just call it the One Note Man? Well, as for me, thank you for watching the Ward Bond Show. And not only that, catch some of the replays of our Oscar-qualified short film interviews, not only on our YouTube channel, but also our brand new YouTube channel just for these films called Bond on Cinema. So I want to thank you for watching. And as for me and for George Sugis, we'll see you next time.